for go for a run in the morning and then and then just be walking and walking all day. I did 13 miles one day. Oh. I just I just groaned and groaned in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> hard not to just hard not to walk. It's just so wonderful. Just just so wonderful walking around. Yeah, especially down there this time of year. Weather's a little warmer than up here, but not too hot yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the architectural historian for SCAD. Um, I wished he was doing a walking tour, but it doesn't seem like he does. Mm-hmm. Um, I watched I watched his YouTube videos of just him walking around Savannah. Mm-hmm. And sometimes some of his, his videos were so good. Sometimes I watched him like four times before he left so I could really experience what he was what he was showing on his on his YouTube channel. Yeah. That helped a lot. That's great. Yeah, very unique, unique areas down there. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I think we'll give it just a few more minutes to let some people join. I see people coming in. Okay, I think we'll give one more minute. Oh, I see a lot of people joining. Maybe I'll give another. Okay, well, we're at 10.01, so I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I'll just kind of start with our introductions, give people a chance to log in. Um, Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for this morning's meeting of the Western Mass Historical Commission Coalition. Please note that today's meeting is going to be recorded. General housekeeping notes, please mute yourself during our presentations. And if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box. Um, We're going to try to address questions at the end if they aren't addressed during the presentations. So to give you a little background in our organization, the Western Mass Historical Commission Coalition was organized in 2014, and we meet about two to three times each year to offer opportunities for members of local historical commissions and other historic preservation (laughs) and municipal planners and advocates to network with colleagues and explore current challenges and successes in the field. Our meeting locations were traditionally rotated within Western Mass, but since 2020, they've been held virtually. And uh, this actually has allowed us to attract attendees from outside of our region. So it's, it's, we enjoyed being able to be together, but this is kind of a benefit that we can have a wider group that we're reaching. Our coalition steering committee includes Beth Giannini with the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, Laura Brennan and Chris Skelly with Berkshire Regional Planning Commission, Jennifer Doherty and Ben Haley from the Massachusetts Historical Commission, Stacia Kaplinson from Preservation Massachusetts, and Shannon Walsh, that's me, from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. The Preservation Mass website hosts archives of all of our past presentations, as well as recordings of recent virtual meetings. And that's where today's recording will be accessed later. We would like to especially thank Preservation Massachusetts Executive Director Erin Kelly for helping us to provide this meeting through Preservation Mass's virtual platform. 
Our topic today is Massachusetts cultural districts, and we're very happy to be able to introduce our first speaker, Lisa Simmons, and she's the Community Initiative Program Manager for the Mass Cultural Council. Lisa's work primarily relates to local cultural councils, festivals, and cultural districts. We thank you for joining us today, Lisa, and we're going to turn it over to you. Oh, okay, great. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just going to set up my slideshow presentation for you. Um, so welcome. My name is Lisa Simmons, uh, as Shannon said, from the Mass Cultural Council. I manage the program that oversees the Local Cultural Council Initiative, the community, um, the cultural district program, and the festivals program. So we uh, we had um, we have a person that manages the cultural district program who has left, but we've just brought someone else on. So um, hopefully we'll be able to make that connection with you folks too if you have any questions. So I'm just going to go over sort of like a brief presentation about the cultural districts program uh, in Massachusetts, and then um, we'll have some presentations. And then if anyone has any questions, in this presentation I can make available um, after this. Um, so. The mission of the Mass Cultural Council, as many of you probably know, is to promote excellence, education, access, diversity. We have just launched a new equity diversity um, plan and are really working with all of our programs to incorporate that new way that we are going to be looking at programs and funding and all of these things at Mass Cultural Council. So there's a lot of really great changes that are going on, a lot of really great programs that are being revamped and new ones that are coming on. And the cultural district program We'll, we'll also be going through some changes, but the basic you know, um, legislation that it was created from will remain the way it is. So really, you know, you know, our mission is to improve the quality of life in Massachusetts, to con contribute to the economic vitality, as it says here, and we do that in a number of ways. So cultural districts, which came into existence um, in 2011, uh, is one of those ways to really marry uh, the economic impact of communities and the cultural impact of communities and bringing them together. So um, it was established by uh, the state legislature. It uh, enables districts, um, enables designated districts to drive economic growth, strengthen, um, you know, and influence distinctive character and the quality of life in communities. Currently, we have 51 uh, cultural districts. We are hoping to bring bring on board a yes, couple more in FY23. Um, and so, uh, so you know, it's it has it has made a really <laughs> big difference um, in uh, in the communities of where the cultural districts are. So, what are um, you know? What do we look at as the definition of a cultural district? So, on the national level, um, you know, cultural districts are des designated all over the country, and that uh, states have the opportunity to sort of tweak what. So, for this one, no, there's no wetlands anywhere near there. Sorry, sorry um, to interrupt. If, if everybody yes, could please make sure coming, that you mute your microphones, mute there's a few participants whose saying, microphones you know, we are would muted. Check to make sure it's not in a resource area. Um, hey, Sarah LaValle. But here, they, nothing. They're, they're just, uh, Shannon, you should, Shannon, you should be able to mute, mute her yourself. Uh, otherwise, we don't care. It's basically just the. the I don't know if I can mute um, Aaron or Stacia. Who's host? Who's considered the host? Mm -hmm. Is it? Is this who's the first who's presenting right? Who is supposed to be presenting right now? Is this Lisa? Yep, yeah. Lisa's presenting, okay. but we have right. a few. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, Lisa. That is perfectly okay. fine. Okay, go ahead. Um, so a cultural district is a specific geographical area in a city and town. This is our definition. Has a concentration of activities and assets. It's navigable. Um, it's not, it's usually compact and in the center of a particular community. It's lively, engaging, it's appealing. Um, so those are sort of the things that we're looking for uh, in, in a cultural district in Massachusetts. So, so um, you know, people may often ask the question, why? And, and for us, cultural districts, as we said, are that center of that city and town. It's not the whole city and town. Um, there's that designated space that concentrated area of arts and business. 
And a lot of it really is around thinking through for cities and towns, the preservation and the revitalization of a certain space, the way it adds a, a perfect, a, a kind of quality of life. It's also, you know, really important to have that state recognition of local arts and business that are going on in certain communities. It is and does provide it um, an economic a way for it to be an economic driver for that particular city and town in that space. Uh, and one of the other things is for cultural districts, it really is an opportunity to look within your town to help support or a city to help support collaborations and marketing partnerships. But in addition to that, for our 51 cultural districts, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have in Massachusetts, we have monthly meetings um, to bring everyone together to talk about things that are working in certain districts and things that <clears throat> may be, you know, in even funding that may be coming around the bend. So it's a great way to keep um, districts networked, informed, and have an understanding of, of what other people are doing. And I think we're going to hear a little bit about that today. Um, what are what are the goals? The goals that we at the Mass Cultural Council say <clears throat> should be for cultural districts. They attract artists and cultural enterprise. I think I think we know that. Um, they encourage business development. They, uh, you know, I, I come from a tourism background. I was in tourism for a number of years before I came to the Mass Cultural Council. And I think that one of the things around that these cultural districts really do and we want them to do is to sort of be this tourism driver, right? And have to have it be a destination that's filled with arts and culture and economic activity. Uh, it, it's also, um, an opportunity to preserve and reuse historic buildings. We've seen a lot in Massachusetts, especially in the western part of Massachusetts, um, you know, buildings that, you know, could really benefit from, a, from, from an organization or a group really focusing on that and helping to restore those buildings and preserve those buildings for artistic purposes. Uh, you know, cultural districts also oftentimes do enhance property values and there's the good and the bad side of that, right? Um, that you're creating a space and providing an opportunity to change sort of the quality of life in a certain area, which will then bring in development and will raise property values, which will bring in different people to communities. But also one of the goals is, is for the districts to create that space for the people that are currently living in there as well. So we're not seeing this huge shift in gentrification, but we're supporting the population that's already there. And I think that's important. And that comes with you know, fostering the cultural development, which is really an important goal of the cultural districts that we support here in Massachusetts. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about what our guidelines are. I mean, obviously our guidelines are, are long and, and they're on our website, but I just wanted to call out sort of, you know, what are, what we really, um, what we really are looking for around um, our cultural district guidelines. And that is the city and town must form this cultural district partnership and it's comprised of a, a diverse mix of organizations that represent shared interests. Um, and the majority of those organizations are located in the district, but there can be peripheral businesses um, that, uh, that are part of those, uh, that's part of that cultural district. So one of the other things that the guidelines require is that the cultural district create a map um, that they form a local resolution with the municipality and everyone and that this resolution is signed saying we do want this cultural district and we're willing to work in a partnership way to create this district. Uh, there has to be evidence of community support um, around this cultural district. It's really important that they that the district have community buy in for a particular district and what they're doing. Uh, we also require that there's a map that's created that shows the boundaries um, of the district. And in creating that map for the boundary of the district, because remember the district has to be navigable, and but there oftentimes are maybe peripheral businesses, like I said, that are outside of the district, but we want to pull them in, you know, in terms of partnership and support. And then we have um, a signage requirement that that the district would have you know have signage from from the state so the guidelines are are much deeper than that and, and much you know broader than that but they are you can find them uh on our website so what do we mean by a cultural district partnership um you know the cultural district partnership is really important it's, it's a way to help manage the relationships in the district it's a way to get buy-in from everybody uh, that we require 
um, you know, identification of partners when when cultural districts are applying, and that really is just looking at district stakeholders. It's it's really interesting when you walk into a community of a district that's um, that wants to be designated, and you know, for me, a couple of times I've been to districts and. And then, you know, having, you know, seeing the district stakeholders, seeing the community buy-in is just, is, is amazing. And I think in the building of a district and getting all of this buy-in, I think communities realize how important arts and culture is to their communities and how many people want that. And I just think that, if, you know, when we do these sort of walkabouts and go review um, the district and do site visits, it's always endearing um, to me to see how many people, you know, really want to have this kind of thing in in their city and town and everyone that comes out to support it so um they do have to identify stakeholders but, you know a core need like what is the need what's the action plan behind this district is really important and that's something that you also are, would have to do a final report for you know and then building the partnership uh and then maintaining the partnership so we'll talk a little bit about what our expectation is so for managing um from so for managing the district uh you know, there is a minimum of, of, of people who should be involved within the management of that district. And of course, it's the city and town because the designation sits with the city or the town. It sits with the municipality. And there's a reason for that, right? There's a reason because we want the municipality to have that buy-in to sit in this management of this district to make sure that, you know, there's a sense of sustainability and continuity uh, of this district. And it is, you know, cultural districts are an economic a development tool really so that they really should be sitting with the municipality the other thing is is that we changed a couple of years ago is that there is a local cultural council in every single city and town in massachusetts that local cultural council is charged with um supporting local cultural activity that's going on in their community and they are grantors they grant out funding each year at a grant cycle that people apply to and we really wanted to make sure that the local cultural council had a seat on these cultural districts because they're oftentimes doing the same type of work and they can support each other. So that is a requirement for us now. It didn't used to be about four years ago. We made that change to make sure that the cultural council has a seat at that table. Um, also, the cultural organizations uh, that are within that district, two or more artists, we really want to make sure what are the what are our biggest pushes and things in Mass Cultural Council is making sure that we're supporting individual artists and making sure that individual artists are seen within their communities. So we want to make sure that there are artists that are sitting on these partnership um, um, boards or, or councils. So for-profit businesses, really important. They're a big part of this cultural district, a big part of, you know, creating that space that's creating that quality of life in these communities. And absolutely for local businesses and chambers um, to be to be part of um, to part, be part of the management team. The actual management of the district is really up to the district about how they want to manage it. They can be managed by a third party and not the municipality. But in that case, there needs to be an agreement. There needs to be um, a signed um, third party uh, um, agreement with the with the third party that's going to be managing it and with the municipality just to make sure that things don't drop through the cracks or anything like that but that is a possibility to manage um to manage your cultural district so what do we see as partnership responsibilities um and meaning the cultural district partnership not necessarily partners outside but the partnership responsibility with all of the people that have made the decision to say yes, we want a cultural district, we're going to build this cultural district, and now these are our responsibilities, right? So we want to make sure that, you know, that the, the team is developing tasks for that district, that it's allocating resources for that district, that there, there are timelines um, and things that are going to be happening within that district, and everyone knows about that, that, that there's a valuation, that there's a means to measure these relationships that are, that are happening within the district and the things that are going on with the district um, and the evaluation of that district. We require a final report at the end of each year from the district to sort of talk about things like demographic changes, who is, who are your, um, who are your stakeholders, uh, you know, th what budgets are you getting money from the municipality, are you getting money from other places, changes in operations, occupancy of businesses, we're really trying to look more at data 
collecting data from districts and understanding like sort of foot traffic. Is it moving the needle on tourism? Um, what are the activities? What are the plans that the district is doing? How are you activating that district on a yearly basis? Um, you know, what are the accomplishments? Uh, who are the new partners? Um, retail sales. So we really want, because because the districts are, are created in order to do all of those things. And we want to make sure that the districts are in, um, you know, are moving in that direction, are being created for that purpose. Uh, so there's all sorts of, and, and each district is different, obviously. Um, each partnership um, uh, group is different in each, in each cultural district. There are those main guidelines that people have to follow, but it's amazing to see the way that people are activating their spaces and really making a difference and having such an impact on their communities. Um, so just a little bit about the, the actual cultural districts um, in Massachusetts. So we have 51 districts right now. Our length of designation is five years. It can go up to 10 years in other states, but our, our length of designation is five years. So you have to redesignate every five years um, and fill out a form and an application to basically say, this is why we want to do this for another five years. Um, you know, it's been a tough year for everyone. Uh, the pandemic, um, you know, d districts, businesses closing, arts organizations closing, so we really, um, one of the things about the legislation for Massachusetts is the legislation for cultural districts did not come with funding. So it came with create these districts, this is gonna be great, you're gonna do this, but it didn't come with a line item for funding. So we at Mass Cultural Council, we have really tried every year to make sure that in our own Mass Cultural Council budget that there is a line item for cultural districts. So, you know, it's been 5,000. We, we, we bumped it up to 7,500, which isn't a lot of money, but at least it's something. And, and for this year, in fiscal year 2021, we really wanted funding for districts to go towards supporting their re rebuilding and renewal efforts. Um, so we have 51 districts, 48 applied for those funds. Um, you know, 56% were earmarked for artists and other creative. It's one of the things that we really found um, during the pandemic and during these really difficult years was really just trying to get money in the hands of artists and arts organizations because they were hit so, so badly, um, as well as we understand culture districts as well. So, um, so, so we also gave them money to supplement their safety to, you know, build, build outdoor dining areas to help, you know, you know, purchase tents if they want to do outdoor things. So um, I have a link here that you can read more about it, but I just wanted to share some of the things that some of our cultural districts did with those that funding that they received. So Springfield, um, you know, did a whole public, mel public health message about stopping the spread of COVID, which was really great. Haverhill worked with stakeholders and Riverfront to do the Haverhill Art Walk outdoors um, and highlighting local businesses. They used their funding for that, did a lot of plein air. Martha's Vineyard used the funds um, for staff supplies for their, in their cultural districts for their bathrooms, um, you know, which is important, right? Um, and so to be able to have extra funding to do something like that. Um, Framingham, more safe pedestrian experiences and in Gloucester and Rocking Neck, they did the Thursday night strolls. So this is just sort of, you know, a way in which cultural districts are using their funds or activating their districts um, that are making them more livable, um, safe environments um, and, and really bringing and, and in that way, opening it up to bring people into their communities. And one of the other things for cultural districts, for our cultural districts in Massachusetts, is it's really important to provide resources and to have those resources available to cultural districts. And as I said, one of the things that we were doing um, before and which we will continue to do is these monthly check-ins and monthly meetings with our cultural districts to help them network, but also to provide resources around marketing, funding, development strategies, um, you know, educational opportunities. And so we have a whole, all on our website, we have a whole list of resources that cities and towns can look at, can use around supporting cultural districts or even if there isn't a cultural district but just ways in which you can 
um, get funding, um, support, marketing for even, you know, spaces and places in, in your cities and towns. Um, additionally, this is something that the state, the National Assembly of State Argency, Art Agencies put out a little while ago that I just thought was a, a really great resource um, around cultural district policies around, around the country. Also, you know, resources that they give out for, for cultural districts um, around creative economy exchanges. They have a great resource toolbook as well, um, and they issue briefs all the time on the supporting of cultural districts. And then you know, policy and evaluation, which I think we all know and understand how important data collection is, how important capturing metrics are, um, even if you're, you know, even if it's just for a certain part of time in July, we did a new festival in the district and this brought in this many people. It's a really great way to also, you know, look for funding if you have that data, if you have those metrics and a cultural district is a great is a great space to be collecting all sorts of information um, about that city and town and bringing people into that space. So I just wanted to make sure that we had, um, that I was shared with you that information. So that's sort of like a brief description of our cultural districts program. It, um, we're, we're really excited, you know, about bringing on new districts uh, in the future and then just to continue to support cities and towns uh, around their cultural activity in Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was great information. Um, appreciate you taking the time to put it together. Okay, so next we have um, we have two case studies that we're happy to be able to share with you today because as Lisa was saying, every district is unique, structured differently. And um, we're happy to have Chris Rembold Assistant Town Manager and Director of Planning and Development for the Town of Great Barrington. And Chris is going to share information about the Great Barrington Cultural District. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can see the screen. All right, great. Um, first of all, thanks, Lisa, for that presentation. And thanks to MCC. It's true for everybody who has a cultural district, you can attest and everybody who wants to form a cultural district, MCC is really supportive. And it was, it was interesting listening to your talk about how districts are put together and how stakeholders are gathered and the boundary decided and the resources identified. Um, that's a really energizing and engaging process. We're four or five years in now and we're still sort of riding that wave. So. It's, it's fun, so um, I encourage everybody to, to, to do that if you're thinking of it. Um, so Great Barrington's downtown uh, cultural district was established in 2018. And if any of you know Great Barrington, it's kind of the center of a much larger cultural landscape in the Southern Berkshires, including you know, farms and restaurants and performance venues and film festivals and hiking trails and skiing and outdoor activities. Um, so it's, it's a really, uh, it's kind of the bullseye of a, of a larger uh, landscape. Let's see. I'll try to focus a little bit on the historic buildings in, in our downtown cultural district. Um, the top left of your screen is town hall. And in the middle top is the Mason Public Library. And the top right is the US Post Office. Uh, bottom left is the first congregational church, uh, followed by the Mahewi Performing Arts Center, the Clinton AME Zion Church. And then at the bottom right, the former St. James Church, now uh, St. James Place. The historic sites have always been an important part of, of Great Barrington's um, identity, and they they form, you know, landmarks within downtown, obviously, and within that cultural district, they kind of bookend the district and give you viewpoints and waypoints and important markers um, throughout the district. I should say, I, I want to highlight just the last two at the bottom left, the um, Clint, the former Clinton AME Zion Church and uh, St. James Place, both of those were slated for demolition uh, within the last decade. Uh, both are being preserved and renovated. 
to be historical and cultural venues. Actually, St. James Place already is. Um, the, uh, the Clinton Church is a really important uh, place uh, for black community in Great Barrington and Southern Berkshires, particularly for uh, civil rights, um, community gathering, and was really important to, uh, to W.E.B. Du Bois and his thinking and his activities. So I wanna note that. Um, and each of these have received, except for the post office, each of these have received funding through um, our local Community Preservation Act for historic preservation uh, activities. And being within the cultural district, first of all, being historic, you're eligible for CPA funds, uh, but also being within the cultural district and contributing to uh, the life and history and culture and activity of downtown uh, was really important in the community's decision to fund the historic preservation of these sites. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, this, is, this map shows in the purple uh, kind of rectangle, the boundaries of our cultural district. And all of the light blue are local historic district commission properties. The, the red stars are all uh, properties on the National Register. And all of the little black dots represent properties that we've inventoried uh, to, uh, to be listed, we hope. So this is really a historic area. and. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of bookended, as I said, by those historic sites. And as you can see from, and just echoing what Lisa said, this is a really compact, walkable, easily identified area. There's, you know, there's a there there. You, you come into downtown Great Barrington Cultural District and you know where you are. And, and it's, a, it's a real sense of uh, cultural community historic feeling. So a little bit about uh, the cultural district. As I said, we're in our fourth year and we have a steering committee that guides our activities. We help organizations connect with district activities and be a part of our efforts. And we uh, also connect with and support individual artists. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few slides. We try to communicate as often as we can. And I have to thank um, Berkshire Regional Planning and Laura Brennan, especially for our communications uh, work through newsletters and Facebook and social media. They're really, really fantastic. We have a lot of activity on those accounts um, and, and that's the primary way we, we engage uh, people. Uh, we work with uh, people with new businesses, with new uh, artists who wanna join the team or who wanna be, who wanna locate in the district. And um, we also collaborate with cultural districts around the around Berkshire County to sort of uh, support each other and, and market the whole the whole county. Last year we did a, um, a banner project for all of the light poles uh, on Main Street and Railroad Street in downtown Great Barrington. These are uh, just four of the I think we did 25 banners. Oh, 24, there it is right on the screen. We did 24 themed banners and we had one of our cultural district committee members work with uh, mostly high school students, but also a few uh, former uh, local high school students who are now professional artists. And we provided some basic themes. Um, we wanted to highlight history. We wanted to highlight important events, um, important people, uh, important ideas. And uh, the students sort of took that on and created this artwork. Um, it was a really great way to, to highlight and spotlight some of the historic structures and, and, and the people in downtown. And we um, took these uh, banners and with a little bio of each artist and we put that onto the cultural district webpage. So if you're walking around downtown, you can look at a banner and find it and find out who, who did it and what their inspiration was, pretty cool. 
I mentioned we support uh, local artists. So last summer, 2021, was the first year of Berkshire Busk. And this was uh, every Friday and Saturday during the summer, we had artists throughout the downtown. And it was pretty incredible, drew tens of thousands of people um, to, to our downtown. And I think really helped uh, businesses and restaurants that may have been struggling uh, during the pandemic. Uh, this comes out of the, the budget that we, the grant that we get from MCC, the $7,500. So uh, the committee uh, applies for the grant and usually earmarks $2,000 to $3,000 just for this sort of, uh, just for this sort of work. A little bit more about the communication on the top right, you can see uh, a little screenshot of the web page and uh, some screenshots of our social media accounts. Uh, so this, you know, these communication channels are really critical to to our mission. Um, you know, we primarily are a megaphone for the the organizations and the businesses within our district. We don't we don't produce um, artwork necessarily or produce shows, but we really want to amplify uh, people within the district, and this is primarily how we how we do that. I mentioned collaborating with the other uh, cultural districts in Berkshire County. Um, so there's, uh, as you can see on the bottom of the graphic there, there are five of us, North Adams, Williamstown, up in the north of Berkshire County, Pittsfield and Lenox and Central County and Great Barrington here down in the south of Berkshire County. Um, a few years ago, the Box Center uh, did Art Week uh, in Massachusetts. When they transitioned off of doing Art Week, uh, Berkshire County picked it up and we decided to do it ourselves. And we collaborate in order to make it a countywide event. Uh, and this year we're planning already for the September, 2022 Art Week. We want to um, do a little bit more. Some of our goals uh, with the cultural district include uh, working some more with our historical commission. Um, I think some of our members may join your, um, these, these um, Western Mass historic uh, workshops that you do. Um, so if anybody's on there, thank you for doing this incredible walking tour. The historical commission developed uh, a walking tour app and brochure, which you see here on the screen. So you can go around downtown, um, which pretty much corresponds with the cultural district and look at different places and learn uh, about the history of those uh, places. It's very, very cool. The great thing about the walking tour app is that it can be expanded um, and you know, maybe evolve into something that uh, uh, includes wayfinding for the downtown where people can park, um, other places that they can visit. Maybe we can sponsor cultural district events uh, or post cultural district events on there. So we want to really uh, try to collaborate uh, that with uh, with the historical commission a little bit more. And I think this is a, a natural way to go. So I think that's just about it, and I'm happy to take questions when we're all when we're all done. Thank you, Chris. That's it. Thank you so much. Yeah, anybody feel free to type your questions in the chat box and we'll address them at the end. Uh, that was awesome information and I'm sure giving people lots of ideas. Um, and last but not least, we have Suzanne Lamanto. She's the assistant planner and director of River Culture for the town of Montague. And Suzanne is going to talk about the Turner's Falls Cultural District. Hello, can you hear me? I'm going to get my slides up. We did this in practice and it worked. So let's see if we can get it done. All right, so you should be seeing a beautiful bridge. What do you think of that, people? Pretty nice. <laughs> so my name is Suzanne Lamanto. I am the director of River Culture and also the uh, Montague assistant planner. So sometimes during this presentation, I will be, you'll, you'll 
be hearing that I'm talking about the cultural district as the facilitator of the district. And sometimes you'll hear that I'm distinctly kind of more in the planning department and we're standing somewhere in between in this thing that's known as placemaking. So um, River Culture is a municipal program um, inside the planning department. And I not only wear all those hats, I have all those heads. So I'm going to, uh, I always start off any presentation with this slide. It's obviously taken by a drone, but this is coming off of Route 2 um, into Turner's Falls. And what you will see on the left is uh, the Connecticut River as it's dammed. Um, and then on the right is our beautiful mill district. Um, Turner's Falls is a planned industrial community. So that all of that infrastructure that you see on the right there, all the mills, the coal silo um, and the uh, tower, um, on the right is the Discovery Center, which is a historic building, um, and the machine shop there is now the Great Hall, but that, these, are, these buildings all go back to the, between the 1880s and about 1910. So that's what it's like to come um, over the bridge um, from Route 2 over into Turner's Falls. I thought what I would do first is just to kind of go through the district, starting at the top of the district here at the Discovery Center, and go down to the other end. Um, and also, I think it's great that Lisa and Chris started out because there's things I don't need to talk about now. So I have more time to talk about Turner's Falls. So um, let's see, it could be the next one. Did it go? Oops, how do I do this? I think this will do it. Let's see, slide. I'm sorry. Here's a second slide. So this is our district. Um, if you go to the top of the, the map, you'll see where the bridge is coming in over the Connecticut River. And so our district is kind of this funny little T-shape. Um, it's Avenue A all the way from all the way from the Discovery Center down to the Carnegie Library, which is marked at the very bottom of the map is uh, number three. And then from Third Street, which is running perpendicular to that, north of that all the way to the waterfront. So um, this is our district. Um, you should know that the town of Montague actually has five villages. Uh, Turner's Falls is one of the five villages. The other villages include Montague City, Miller's Falls, Lake Pleasant, and Montague Center and the village of Turner's Falls. Um, and uh, Turner's Falls is very proud. In, in um, 2011, it received a grant for, uh, what was that? Um, I think that's on the next slide, actually. But I also wanted to point out where we are um, on the map. So you'll see Franklin County there in pink, and then Montague is in red. So that's right where we are, kind of at the intersection of Route 91 and Route 2. Next. All right, so this is at the top of the cultural district. Um, you're standing here in the slide to the left. You're standing on the shores of the uh, Unity Park, which is um, our biggest outdoor recreation area, looking at the bridge. And then you'll be here you are at the Discovery Center looking back at the bridge. So the Discovery Center is a group of historic mills that have been turned into a museum of um, um, the waterfront. Um, it's a DCR museum. And if you haven't been there, you definitely should. There's beautiful lawns and gardens, um, exhibitions, um, and that is right at the top of the district here. We'll go down a little bit more. We're going down Avenue A now. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Here we are at Unity Park. So here at Unity Park on the left, you'll see, of course, we have lots of playgrounds and courts, uh, sand volleyball, baseball fields. Um, it's a really outstanding um, amenity, outdoor amenity. We have a wonderful bike path that's three miles long. Um, I think if you know, if you look here on the left side, you'll see that's a rain garden. So one of the things in Turner's Falls and it's important to the planning department is that we're always um, working with nature. So this rain garden in the foreground is just a natural way to deal with flood water um, by using pollinator species and native species of plants and shrubs and trees. And the image on the right is the Unity Skate Park, which has been completed for about five years now. Um, that is one of the best skate parks in Massachusetts. Um, I think it's the only skate park in Franklin County and it is constantly packed. Um, so that's right down at Unity Park. Let's do another. So here's Avenue A. And since we're talking about historic buildings, you'll see on the left um, some 18, I, well, there's the Shea Theater. So that was kind of 
built in about, I think, 1920, and then the building next to it is older. And then across the street, you'll see kind of a mix of historic buildings. Um, these buildings, these brick buildings were industrial era buildings, mostly from 1880 to 1920. And uh, the Shea Theater has recently been renovated with about $600,000 of state, municipal, um, and private funds. Um, the building is interesting because the building is actually owned by the town. So sometime in the mid-1980s, when things weren't so great for Turners, the, the, the town had the foresight of buying the building. And that's so that it didn't get turned into anything else. Um, if it had been gutted and all the stage taken out and all the seats taken out, it would never have, it would never have been turned back into a theater. So the town uh, bought that building back when it seemed like kind of a crazy thing to do. But here we are using it and it's completely renovated and up and running. Um, on the right, you'll see some retail buildings, all of them redone. Loot is a very popular retail space. And what's interesting, it's used exactly the way it was 100, over 100 years ago with retail on the bottom and then two levels of, of apartments. So that's pretty typical in downtown Turner's Falls architecturally. Oops, wrong way, sorry about that. So if you continue down um, Avenue A, um, there, is, there are more of these brick structures, three-story buildings with retail underneath, apartments on the top. The town of Montague has been working really hard to replace these sidewalks to make them more ADA accessible, um, to put pocket parks, places to sit, places for people to get together. The area on your left is there's a sculpture by an artist named Tim De Christopher, and it's called Rock, Paper, Scissors. And it's based on um, rock being our indigenous, um, um, history and paper and scissors being part of our paper and cutlery background in the industrial era. And there's a nice shot of the seating area and a uh, view down Avenue A going towards the south end of the cultural district. And this park was just reopened in the fall. This is called Spinner Park and it's called Spinner Park because we have a um, we have a sculpture of a spinner. So this sculpt, the sculpture on the left is an, obviously a neoclassical um, work of art and it was cast in the 1980s, but from original 19th century mold. So this park has been completely redone um, with grant money. It's well used. And um, I always like to point out that I put those red chairs there knowing that they weren't gonna get stolen and they haven't been stolen. There's chairs in the park and they're movable. And I told everybody that, you know, um, that this was the way to go and and people love this park even though it's only a couple of months old and somebody you know we're the kind of community where how can i say this people feel like they can do things like sew a little flag a little ukrainian flag and put it outside so we're a very tight-knit community i should mention that in the town of montague there's only eight thousand people and in downtown turner's falls there's only four thousand people so um it's a very small tight-knit group of restaurant owners, business owners, artists, um, and other stakeholders and residents. And when we get to the end of the cultural district, here is on the left, Pesky Scott Park. Pesky Scott is a nipmuc word that means where the rock is split by fire. And right across the street from there is the Carnegie Library. So that was a, obviously a, a, Georgian, a Georgian structure built around 1906 with money um, that was granted by Andrew Carnegie. So that marks the end of our cultural district. Um, at Pesky Scott Park all summer, we host mostly with cultural district money, we host um, events um, that are music events, theater events, events for families, lots and lots of movies. So that's our park, one of the two places in town besides Unity Park where we like to use cultural district money. We like to bring art and culture to people. Um, there's a, lots of our residents are kind of either lower income residents or don't own vehicles or the Kind of, it's kind of population where people don't go away over the summer and go, don't go on vacation. So we feel really strongly that we should spend our money on bringing those things to them. And this is one of the places that we do it. So, um, so how is Turner's Falls, a, a, the cultural district structured? Um, the story goes back to river culture um, that 
River Culture was founded in 2005 with a Mass Cultural Council grant, an Adams grant. Um, so that is kind of how we started out. Um, we were chosen to be part of this creative economy pilot program funded by the Mass Cultural Council. Um, Turner's Falls was chosen because of its strong sense of place, its architecture as you have seen, and its wonderful situation on the Connecticut River, but most especially the willingness of town officials uh, to foster art and culture. So this is an image, you've already seen it before, of the 2011-2012 Commonwealth Awards, uh, which is presented every two years to um, spotlight, to put a spotlight on extraordinary contributions in the art, humanities, and science. Um, so uh, Turner's Fall River Culture received that in 2011. And that, and the woman in the middle is my predecessor, Lisa Duvall, who is now with the Franklin County Chamber. Um, so when that program, when the Adams Grant was sunsetted sometime in 2017, the town of Montague had to decide what it was gonna do with river culture. And um, we looked at all the numbers and we presented all the numbers to the finance committee and it went to town meeting in 2018. And at that point, town meeting members voted for river culture to be permanent or for there to be a, um, uh, a permanent creative economy position inside of Montague Town Hall, which is unusual, I think, for a community of 8,000 people. Um, but through the Adams Grant, it was so obvious how this worked. I mean, it was a 10-year period where we were able to um, show what art and culture could do inside of, a, inside of an economy. And so town meeting members were sold on that. And so the way that... Um, the Turner's Falls Cultural District works now is it does work inside of river culture. So um, I am the facilitator of that grant and I work with stakeholders to implement the projects and programs that we, you know, decide on together. So just, um, so yeah, so after it was sunsetted, it just kind of made sense for the Turner's Falls Cultural District to be inside of river culture. Um, and what that means for me is that I have um, accounts that I spend money only in Turner's Falls. So this would be cultural district money, the $7,500 that we're getting, that we receive every year. Um, I have a river culture, river culture general account because I work now in all the five villages of Montague. And, um, and, I, and, and so there's these different piles of money that I get to spend around town and spend with people, um, but uh, our town accountant keeps that all straight. Um, and we're very pleased to have received a bunch of festival grants this year. Thank you so much, Lisa.